Welcome. This is 2048L for laboratory. And the laboratory we're going to be doing is beam on the wall. And it's a dry lab. What that means basically is that for one reason or another we can't be here face to face. And so the idea is that maybe we can um, uh, simulate the laboratory. It's not ideal, but it works yeah, reasonably well. Um, so, uh, how are we going to go about this dry lab? Well, basically, I've got a whole mess of uh, student notebooks. And so I go through the student notebooks and I find some data. And then um, I present the data as if I was your lab partner. You keep the usual notes uh, in your uh, lab book. And then uh, I, I get copies of the, of the notes you've taken. Sometimes you'll be doing a graph, and I expect you to do the graph normally. Uh, sometimes you'll be doing a calculation. Um, in typical lab groups, sometimes there's one person who manipulates the equipment and the other person takes the notes, which is not ideal. <laughs> if you're the note taker, you're practicing taking notes. <laughs> um, not learning science, so be careful. Uh, we're going to, um, uh, there's a few different types of labs, of course. There's some labs that simulate research. And then there's other labs which basically give you experience. And then there's a third type of lab which basically gives you practice for exams. And that's what today's lab is really about. It's, it's really about making sure that everybody in the class has done uh, a typical test question. And... Uh, You've seen it concretely so that you have a better chance of figuring out what's going on. So let's begin. So in your lab book, you would put down uh, lab, and I can't remember the number, it's probably lab 10. And this is called the beam on the wall lab. Uh, sometimes it's called a second condition of equilibrium lab because that's what we're using. Um, sometimes it could be called a statics lab. But the most figurative one, the most picturesque name is the beam on the wall lab. And what's our objective? Well, in principle, our physics objective will say today we will predict the tension force in the string that supports the beam in a beam on wall apparatus and they will say we compare our prediction with a physical setup. So in the lab we'd actually build this apparatus and we'd do the calculation and then we'd look at the tension meter, the uh, uh, Newton gauge in the string and we'd say how does this number compare with what we predicted. Um, Let's sketch out the apparatus so that you can see uh, what the system's like. Uh, let's do, well, let's do a principle. So let's just do an example. Because my educational uh, hope is that you're learning how to do this for a test. And uh, let's keep it. Uh, typical to how it would be in a test. So in a test we would have 
a wall and we'd have a beam. Let's make this beam long so we have plenty of space. Uh, the beam's going to be horizontal and there's going to be a, a certain mass for it. Uh, let's call this, I don't know, let's call it uh, M1. It's in the middle, so let's call this X1. And measuring from the turning axis, and the turning axis is there. I decided to put the turning axis there. And the principle I'm using is that if this object is in equilibrium, I can put the turning axis anywhere and the sum of the torques about that turning axis will be zero. Okay. Um, I'm going to make things a bit more interesting. And so I'm going to add a mass. Let's call this M2. And let's say that this is X2 away from the turning axis. And then I need something to stop this thing from just swinging clockwise and uh, going vertical. So I'm going to have a string. And that string is going to have a tension force in it. Notice M1 is a mass. M M, sorry, M1 is a mass, M2 is a mass, and tension is a force. And that shows me I need to just correct something. Sorry about that. Let's call this M1. The masses you put inside the object, the forces at the end, are at the end of arrows. Um, and we'll say that this tension force is X. This this we'll say that this tension force connects to the to the beam X three meters away from the turning axis. So I'm measuring forces, well masses, which will give me forces and distances from the turning axis. That's not all the forces that are in this problem. There's got to be some forces here. This frictional bit is doing something. Well, it's causing friction. So let's have a frictional bit, FF. And, you know, the, the rod wants to push into the wall. And so we have an FN. Now, the physics part of this is why I choose to put my turning axis at the point where the ruler meets the wall. I could put it anywhere and in principle the system would work. And the reason why I put my turning axis at the point where the ruler uh, or the beam hits the wall is that by putting my turning axis in line with FF and in line with FN means that there's no lever arm. And so there is no torque caused by the FF, and there's no torque caused by the FN. The forces are there, but they don't create a torque. They don't create a turning effect. The tension creates a turning effect. The weight of this M1 will cause a turning effect. The weight of the M2 will cause a turning effect. But, and that's because they are applied at some distance from the turning axis. So the clever bit is where you put the turning axis more than anything else. Um, okay, so we've got to do a little bit more work. Um, I know that this is going to be a force of M1 times G and I know this is going to give me a force of M2 times G. And now I have pretty well all my forces represented and I'm in good shape. Let's, because it's an example, let's put down some numbers here. I'm going to go back to the example I used in this lab. 
so m1 was equal to let's have a look we said three meters there's three kilograms so the ruler is the beam is three kilograms and m2 this is the mass that's added let's make that five kilograms and then of course we have three distances we have x1 and this is the distance to uh, there which is three meters so the ruler the the the, the uh, beam is six meters long it's a uniform ruler and so the center of mass is halfway along it we did this in class um, x2 is equal to let's make that two meters long so it's two meters away and then x3 that's to where the string is attached equals four meters you can see I'm just using numbers here aren't I and then I need this angle theta and theta is equal to 20 degrees what do I want? I want to find tension. Well, I can help myself a bit. Torques are caused by, uh, are equal to the perpendicular component of force times the lever arm or the perpendicular component of the lever arm times the force. And sometimes it's good to think of them one way and sometimes it's good to think of them the other way. In this example, it just seems to me that it just makes sense to say that this is T. Now, is it T cosine theta or is it T sine theta? Hopefully you're getting real good at that and it's going to be T sine theta. And there's my perpendicular force times the lever arm would be x3. So what principle am I using? I'm saying the sum of the torques about the turning axis is equal to zero. And so let's let's work through this. So we can say m1, well that's a mass times g now that's my force times x1 now there's my torque caused by this mass in the this this the weight of the ruler um if you put your finger on the turning axis and look at the force the force is going to tend to move the ruler in a clockwise direction and that is a negative torque now we're summing so we the operator is addition but the senses the signs need not be addition this is a negative torque let's take the next one which is m2 well that's a mass times g gives me a, f a force times uh, uh, x2 and again, if you put your finger on the turning axis and you move your other finger, your other hand, along the direction of the force, it tends to move the thing in a clockwise direction, which is a negative torque. And, well, there's three more forces, but only one of them has a lever arm, which is this T sine theta. This is a force, so I don't need to, don't need to worry about G. T sine, and it's going to be 20 degrees, or T sine theta, we'll leave it in, in, in letters. T sine theta, and that is X3 away. Now, if I look at this, that force is tending to push that ruler in a counterclockwise direction which gives me a positive torque. FF has no lever arm and so there's no torque. FN has no lever arm to the turning axis and so 
there's no torque for that. So I've got all the torques and this equals zero. Let's put some numbers in. So we have M1 minus three times 10 times uh, three plus minus M2 is five times 10 times two plus plus well we want to find t but this is going to be sine 20 times uh, x3 x3 is 4 equals 0 that is going to be minus 90 added to minus 100 let's be cute and say equals t sine 20 times 4 over bring that back 4 sine 20 if, if I lost you just pause and fill in the step I'm just running out of space so this equals and I'll get my calculator and I'm gonna say 190 divided by 4 enter divided by sine 20 enter 138.88 139 so this would be equals uh, 139 newtons I've got an issue with my signs so let's have a look at that oh, of course if I take this to the other side it becomes a negative so this equals minus so T is equal to 139 newtons watch out for detail like that sometimes you can catch a mistake when there's a sign that doesn't make sense so watch out for detail like that I feel I squashed it in a little bit at the end but um, that's a typical test question that's what I want you to get out of this the next bit is let's do a lab to prove that this stuff works let's do a, another example so let's call this example two. And let's do the same basic setup. We have a wall, we have a ruler. We said the ruler was M1. That's gonna give us M1G and this distance here is going to be x1 just like before we have a added mass m2 and that's going to be x2 away we have a string and that gives us a tension and this is 20 degrees and this is x3 away so those are all the obvious things but we can't forget that we have a friction force opposing the tendency of the rod or the root or the beam to slip downwards and then we have a normal force just so you realize I don't have to ask you about the tension I can ask you for FN or FF so take a minute and try to think where you would put your turning axis if you wanted to find FN and you'd want to avoid having to get the torque of T and you'd want to avoid having to get the torque of FF 
so you'd put your turning axis up here in the top left hand corner. If you wanted to find uh, uh, FF then you could want to avoid having to deal with T and you'd want to avoid having to deal with FN so you'd put your turning axis where those two lines cross. I actually lay pens down. FN would be a pen going across the page. T would be a, another pen going diagonally across the page. And where they cross is where my turning axis is. Again, I can say that my, if I have my numbers, I can say that my M1 equals three kilograms. I can say my M2 is equal to five kilograms. I can say my x1 is equal to 3 meters. I can say my x2 is equal to uh, uh, 2 meters. I can say my x3 is equal to 4 meters. I can say my theta is equal to 20 degrees. And I'm trying to find, what am I trying to find in this case? I said FF. And the principle I'm using is that the sum of the torques about the turning axis equals zero. And so I say, oh, I'm trying to find FF. So I can say, yeah, FF times X times, well, yeah, times X, well, the distance from here to there is X3. There's one torque. FF times X3, that's going to be clockwise, which is negative. Added two. Now the next force, which is going to give me uh, um, a torque is the, the weight of the, of the, of the um, beam. So that would be M1 times G. Now for its distance, I've been a bit too clever here. It's the distance between where the M1 is and the turning axis, which is X3 minus X1. It's just a number. It's just in, when you write it down in algebra, it looks more complicated. And that also, well, that's going to give me a counterclockwise torque. Can you see that? I don't want to mess up my diagram particularly, but can you see how it's making this thing go whoosh, like that? Let's see if I can erase that. Yeah, okay. So that's how you do it. And so this is going to be uh, positive because it's counterclockwise. And then the other force is going to be, of course, it's going to be m2 times g and that's going to be at a distance of x3 minus x2 again it's just a number and again if i look at that it's going to go in a counterclockwise direction which is positive equals zero remember clockwise torques give you negative clockwise turning effects are a negative torque counterclockwise turning effects are a positive torque and so I go, okay, let's put some numbers in. FF is what I want to find. FF times, uh, let's have a look. It's going to be X3, which is 4. And we said that that's going to be a clockwise. So that should be negative. plus m1 is 3 is uh, 3 times 10 times well now it's x3 which is 4 minus x1 which is 3 4 minus 3 is 1 it's that distance there and it's only 1 meter and this is going to be a positive torque because it's making it go in a counterclockwise direction. 
Can you see, by the way, that if you have a better diagram, if the lengths were really proportionate, that would be very easy to work out what the, what the distance is. And then we have M2, and M2 is 5 kilograms times 10 times the distance between X3, which is 4 meters, minus X2, which is 2 meters, which gives me 2 meters. That's going to be a positive equals zero. So minus 4FF is equal to, let's take these to the other side, minus 30 plus minus 100, which equals minus 130 so FF is equal to 130 over 4, which equals uh, 3 fours are 12, so that's going to be 30, 32.5, 32.5 Newtons. So there's another example. Can you see how I can make a whole bunch of problems out of just one diagram even? So you can't just remember the problem. So let's go into the lab and see what we have. Well, in the lab, we have a pole. It's not a wall, it's a pole. It just makes life easier. And I have a hinge here. It's basically a bolt. And we've drilled a hole through a meter ruler at the one centimeter mark and the uh, uh, we've added a mass and the mass is here and then we, had, we, had a, we added it with a clip I need to clean this up a little bit And we have another clip out here. And we have the weight of the mass of the ruler. And that's in the middle. And we'll call it M1 for the mass, M. C1 for the clip, we'll call it M2 for the ruler, and we'll call it MC3 for the clip that holds the string. Okay, so what forces are we causing? We're causing a tension force, of course. And then we have a M two G force, and then we have a M C one plus M one G force, and then we actually have a third force down here, which is going to be M C three times G. And then of course we have our FF and our FN, this is FN, and this is our FF, it's a weird kind of FF, it's a hinge, but it, in principle it's, the force is going the same directions. And then we have some distances, and we can call this X2 to the M2 business, and then we can call this X3. Uh, it's got x x1 to the x1 business and x3 to the x3 business so that's how we chose to set it up okay fair enough let's get some numbers so one of us goes across and we measure our masses. 
so M1, MC1, which is the clip, it's the tiny little clip that's just used to suspend the mass from. And MC1 is going to be uh, 21. Don't do the conversion. If the machine is giving you it in grams, write it down in grams. And then we need the actual mass we add, M1. And we look on that and it says it's 500 grams. And then we say, well, what about M2? So we take the ruler across to the massing machine and it says 189.3 grams. Okay. And then we say, okay, M3, the little clip, the tiny little clip that's holding the string in position. And we look at that and we get 22.1 grams. Slight difference between those uh, between those two, it's an MC, it's an MC3. So those are our masses. We need to measure some distances. So X1 is equal to, X1 is the distance to where we hung the mass. And so I'll tell you a story. We used to have rulers with all their markings on and we'd say well just figure out what the distances are and people had a tough time with it and then we stuck paper over all the markings and we gave people a ruler to measure the distance between things and because they were measuring just between two points rather than trying to calculate the difference between two points suddenly things got a lot easier so we took a, a, a meter ruler and I measured from this hinge to the, where the clip is, the middle of the clip. I measured that and I found I got a distance of 75 centimeters. Write down what you see. And then I measured, ah, well I didn't need to measure because I can't see this point where the center of mass of the ruler is. But I know that the center of mass is at the middle of the ruler. It's a uniform ruler. It's tempting to put down 50 centimeters, but remember your hinge is one centimeter in. So that's actually 49 centimeters. And then from that hinge over to this MC3, again, I got a ruler and I measured that entire distance and I got X3 was equal to, and that was 96 centimeters. Cool. So, um, and then the angle, the angle between these things was 40 degrees, so theta, and theta is equal to 40 degrees. What's the principle that I'm using? The sum of the torques about the turning axis equals zero where shall I put the turning axis? I don't want to deal with FF and I don't want to deal with FN so I'm going to put the turning axis right where that hinges. And then I say, okay, let's write it out in principle. M1 plus MC1 times G times X1 these two masses are added together. They are tending to turn this thing in a clockwise direction about this hinge. Can you see it? Whoosh. Clockwise torques are negative. So that's going to be a minus. We're summing, so we add. And then we go to M2. It's going to be just M2 times G times X2. That is also turning our ruler around 
the axis in a clockwise direction. So that's also going to be negative. I did two. We've got a third one. MC3 times G times X3. Now maybe that's going to be such a small torque I don't need to worry about it, but it's a long way away. A little mass, a long way away. A little mass causes a little weight, a little weight, a long way away. Could have a decent torque, so got to be careful with that. And again, this is tending to take me in a clockwise direction about that turning axis. So again, <laughs> I already put it in. There's a negative. Added to. Well, again, this is going to be that is going to be T sine theta. So I have the force which is T sine theta, and that is x3 away. We don't need to worry about g because it's a force, not a mass. And this is tending to take me in a clockwise direction, in a counterclockwise direction, so that's going to be positive. Equals zero. So it's more complicated than a typical test question, and that's, you know, because it's a lab. Let's put some numbers in. We're almost there. So this is minus, and let's do the conversion. So this is going to be 0 0.021 plus 0 0.5 times 10, I'm going to use 10, I just find it so much easier than 9.8 times x1 is 0 0.75 I'm actually going to do this I don't know if you've ever seen this before. I'm going, to, I'm going to try and do it vertically. That's the first term. And I'm going to add on to that minus M2, 0 0.1893 times 10. And the distance to uh, M2 is X2, which is... 0 0.49 I'm going to add on my next term which is going to be the little clip which is 0 0.0221 times 10 times this is 0 0.96 And then for my last term, I have, let's have a look, T cosine, uh, sorry, T sine. T sine 40, there's the force times the distance, which is 0 0.96. And that's a positive. So now I can do some math. I'm going to get my calculator. I'm going to go point zero two one plus point five times ten. Yeah, that didn't work. You do this as well, so you can check it, lab partner. So 0 0.021, uh, that's what's going on, 0 0.021 plus 0 0.5 is going to give me that, times 10 is going to give me that, times 0.75 gives me that. What did you get? I got 3 3.9075. And for this next set of numbers, oh, it's a negative, don't forget. 
and for this next set of numbers I get point one point one eight nine three times ten times point four nine enter this one's not so big it's going to be minus 0 0.92757 not going to round, don't want to round because you can get into trouble rounding and then the third little bit is point zero two two one times ten times point nine six and I'm getting minus zero point two one two one six and then this last bit is gonna be sine 40 make sure you're in degrees times 0.996 enter so this will be 0 0.61708 t you add these up that added to that added to that added to that equals zero so I can say 3.9075 plus 0 0.92757 plus 0 0.21216 equals 0 0.61 seven or eight T so T is equal to three point nine or seven five added to zero point nine two seven five seven added to zero point two one two one six divided by 0 0.61708 so let's check it so 3.9075 plus point nine two seven five seven enter plus point two one two one six enter divided by point six one seven zero eight enter and I'm getting 8.179 which equals 8.2 newtons that's what my calculation is so lab partner we've got a number and what we got to do is we got to go back to the apparatus and we go to read what this uh, force gauge is reading. That reads the tension in the string. And according to uh, previous students, so this would be observe of T when observed the 
value of t on the force gauge was and it was 8.3 newtons pretty good actually pretty good physics works and so we have a conclusion the predicted value of T was 8.2 newtons the measured value of T is 8.3 newtons now we've not looked at uncertainties we've not particularly tried to do this in a rigorous way because I want to get across the physics of the problem so I'm not going to pretend I'm not going to say oh look at the I'm just going to turn around and say these are in reasonable agreement if we were doing this quantitatively then I would have an uncertainty in my measured value I'd have an uncertainty in my predicted value because that's also based on measurement and I would do a comparison diagram to compare the two but that's not the principle of this lab some labs are about that this is about can you do this problem when you see it in a test so let's not pretend let's just say these are in reasonable agreement we're not trying to say whether they're experimentally equivalent we're just trying to say oh they're in reasonable agreement it seems like it works so if you have down basically what I have down for my class that would be a good lab write-up and I think that it's a good set of notes for you to get ready for a test and there we have it